Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this installment of Boyce Thompson Institute's Breaking Ground Discussion Series. My name is AJ Bushy, and I'm in the Communications Department here at BTI. And for this month's Breaking Ground, we welcome Dr. Eric Richards, a molecular biologist and geneticist here at BTI, whose main research focuses on the three-dimensional organization of nuclei in plant cells. And today's discussion is going to be a real treat. I'm really looking forward to it uh, because we'll be going back in time to talk about the history of how scientists thought about whether genes or the environment were responsible for evolution and inheritance and how BTI's founding fits in with that story. So it's gonna be really, really neat one. Learn a lot of, a lot of stuff I have no idea about. Um, so hi, Eric, welcome. Hi, AJ. Uh, before we get going, we'll have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, during the session, all participants will be muted. Um, if you've joined us before you, you probably know the drill. Um, if you haven't, uh, Eric and I will talk for about a half hour about the topic, and then we'll have about a half hour uh, Q&A with everyone out there in, in Zoom land. And uh, you can ask questions in the chat, but everyone will be muted. And I've enabled a live transcript function, so you should be seeing closed captions. Um, they're okay. They're computer generated, sometimes with scientific terms. Uh, they don't, they're not entirely accurate, but hopefully they help if you need them. Uh, if you'd like to turn it off, you can do that with a, the, there's a live transcript button down at the bottom of your screen, so you can turn those off. And thanks again, everyone out there for joining us today. And uh, Eric, thanks again for coming. And uh, could you could you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to BTI and your research? Sure. So I um, think I'll start sharing my screen. Can I do that now? Yeah, sure. All right, so thank you, AJ, and thanks everyone for, for attending. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here and, and tell you about the work we're doing in epigenetics, but also try to put that into a historical perspective. So um, I, I started out uh, working on, on epigenetics in uh, my graduate work at some level, I started working in Fred Ausubel's lab where I first started working on plants and uh, genome structure, but then moved to uh, a fellowship and a faculty position at the Boyce Thompson Institute, <laughs> no, uh, sorry, the Gold Spring Harbor Laboratory, uh, jumping ahead. So at, at, uh, at Cold Spring Harbor, I started working on DNA methylation, which is one of the most fundamental uh, bits of information that gets added epigenetically to the genome. And from there, I moved on to uh, Washington University and, and took a faculty position where I had a group working on DNA methylation primarily, and then moving in 2008 to the Boyce Thompson, uh, I shifted to higher order levels of epigenetic information. So let me start talking a little bit about what I mean by epigenetics. And um, <laughs> Epigenetics is a term you'll hear a lot, and everyone uses it a little differently. So I'm going to give you my definition of, of epigenetics. There's many different kind of subfields in epigenetics, but they're all focused on this idea that inheritance or at least genetic information is more than just what's in the DNA molecule in terms of the sequence of the DNA molecule. There's information that's superimposed on top of that DNA information, that DNA sequence, and that's what we call epigenetics, so literally on top of genetics. And that can take many different forms. I mentioned chemical modification of DNA, uh, cytosine methylation is the most important one and the most studied, and that's kind of a fundamental level of, of uh, packaging. But um, you also have to organize a, a molecule in three-dimensional space, and that's really where my lab is now focused on that kind of intersection between three-dimensional architecture of the genome and cell biology, so how the DNA molecule is packaged inside uh, in the case of plants and, and uh, animals inside a compartment called the nucleus. So um, I think many of you may be familiar with this idea that DNA is a very long string of, of nucleotides. If you took out all the DNA in a human cell, just one human cell stacked it end to end, 
uh, it would be two meters long, which is taller than I am. That's packed into a space that is roughly five to 10 microns in diameter inside a nucleus inside the cell. So to kind of give you a scale to think about, if you think about the nucleus, say, as a tennis ball that size, the length of the DNA molecule that is put inside that tennis ball shaped uh, nucleus would be 13 kilometers long or roughly eight miles. Wow. So there is a lot of packaging that goes on and it's easy to think that that packaging has to be so extreme that uh, things must just be packed in and, and disorganized. And that's not the case as I'm gonna show you in a moment. So there's organization and architecture that matter inside, inside your cells. Now, uh, this is an analogy if you think about DNA or genetic information as, as a collection of, of books. If it's put into a space, a three-dimensional space that's kind of an unadorned room uh, and just thrown in there um, haphazardly, that information is there. You just can't access it very well. So what you can't find, you can't use. Um, but we all are familiar with libraries. And here's an example of library where architecture of the library does help you get at that information. Books are stored on the periphery and they're organized in different ways based on topic. There's areas where you can access that information, read and move between one section or the other. So this type of intersection between architecture and information is what we're interested in when we talk about three-dimensional uh, epigenetics. Now, that room analogy holds uh, when we start to actually peer inside cells. So this is a picture, a three-dimensional um, micrograph of a nucleus. The color here is blue. Uh, for the DNA, and then different parts of the genome are either here in kind of a fuchsia or an aqua green. And um, if this video plays, it will rotate, and you'll see the three-dimensional architecture. So this is a, a nucleus from an Arabidopsis plant, and this is a normal plant on the left. One of the techniques that my lab uses, one of our main approaches is to look at mutants. So a mutant that has uh, an architectural defect, that is a mutation in a gene that encodes a protein involved in the architecture of the nucleus. And then we can see what happens to the genome. So in this case, um, on the right uh, is a picture of a mutant nuclei. Uh, and uh, it has a different rearrangements of the compartments. So you can see the green area, which is normally hanging out with the pink bits in certain rooms, if you will, inside the nucleus is now spread out uh, and, and not organized properly. So by using this type of approach of looking at mutants, we can see how when we change the nucleus and the architecture, do we change the genome? Now, the transition here is uh, we do titles about environment, right? And uh, if you're familiar with epigenetics from the popular literature and you've, you know, maybe you have read articles about people thinking about epigenetics, um, it doesn't sound like what I've just been telling you about. Oftentimes you hear about epigenetics in the context of how say diet, disease, famine, stress, how that can affect your progeny, okay? And the connection here is this idea that the environment can't really change genes very easily. They can't change the DNA sequence easily, but they might be able to change all of this epigenetic information which is superimposed on genes. And if that can affect how genes operate, well, then maybe there is reason to think that things like stressful situations or diet or disease could affect not only your health, but that might lead to 
changes in the next generation. This is an exciting thought. It's a scary thought. Uh, and frankly, it's a very controversial thought. And that's kind of where we lead into the history. I wanted to trace that. Yeah. So, so it sounds like primarily we're talking about which genes get turned on and off. And that is how, you know, how it's packaged, how it can unfold and, and different genes can get turned on. And there's chemical modifications as well that can turn off genes or turn on genes. And that's, that's the gist of what we're talking about here, right? Right, there's the idea that, that you can have genes, for instance, um, that a common example would be, say, in, in cancer, there are genes called tumor suppressor genes um, that, that protect you from, from um, cancer by um, affecting cell death or, or, or uh, essentially a quality control on cell division. And some of the genes that encode the proteins involved in that uh, they can be shut off epigenetically, meaning the gene is there, the sequence is fine. It's just that if you've packaged it into a compartment of the genome or you have a certain code on it, like you're talking about AJ, certain types of, of proteins or decorations on those proteins, that gene can be shut off even though you have it, even though it's right. not right. broken. And, and so people are very interested in and how these quote unquote epi mutations could be involved in, in human health and how manipulation of epigenetic codes could affect um, and health by, you know, in, in this case, turning on tumor suppressor genes. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating idea. It's something you don't, when you think of genetics, I think most people do just think of the genes and what is there, not necessarily all this other stuff that, that's going on at the same time. Um, so I want to ask you about, the, you have this question at the bottom of this slide. Um, is the architecture of the nucleus and epigenome altered by the environment? So how people attempted to answer this question in the past, going back to the history element? Well, in a way, they're, you know, they're, they're, what they've done in the past and what they've done now or what they're doing now is, is similar. And that really gets to the, my, the core of their um, my interest in history is that uh, around 1990 and 2000, there's a lot of discussion in the epigenetics field about doing the kind of experiments that you might imagine that is stressing plants out, stressing animals out. Now you know what this epigenetic information looks like. You know, you know what to look for biochemically. If you stress out individuals, can you change the epigenome? That's the first question. And then if you go from one generation to the next, is that remembered? Is it transmitted? So people started doing those experiments very, um, you know, in some ways, um, these were things that, that were very exploratory, but it reminded me very much of literature that I was reading about in the early 20th century where people were doing very similar type of experiments. They were taking animals and, and plants, uh, putting them under different environmental conditions, and then asking, oh, could this drive evolution? So that's, that's the, the parallel that first got me interested in, in, in history. So this is the, the transition kind of back to thinking about where those ideas came from. And, and I I think the, the bottom line here is that these ideas that are quote unquote old are, are never old, they're reintroduced, they're retooled in, in new contexts. So, um, and, and I think looking at history gives you a lot of raw material for thinking about um, experiments. It's very easy to be uh, overwhelmed and impressed by the breadth of, of understanding that scientists had um, when they were taking this very large synthetic view of things um, hundreds of years ago, um, where they really weren't specialized as much as we are now. They, they really had a much more holistic view. Um, and, and so I'm going to break this down into kind of two simple buckets. Um, there are ideas that have been around uh, for a long time, and I'm going to kind of just focus a couple hundred years ago 
on um, an institution in, in, in Paris, the uh, Museum of Natural History, and, and a series of, of, of folks who uh, worked there. Uh, some of them may be familiar to you, Buffon, Lamarck, and, and Geoffroy Saint-Hilaire. And I'm going to spend the most time telling you about the last one here. But um, I've kind of shoehorned the ideas here into a box that says that the environment is steering diversity. All of these researchers were interested in the origin of, of biological diversity. They all had different ideas about how it worked in its particulars, but um, one kind of fundamental idea is that the environment was driving it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, Etienne uh, Geoffroy saint hilaire did some experiments in, in the early 1800s to see if he could use environmental conditions to make what he referred to as monsters. Now, this is pre-genetics. He's really thinking about this in what we would think about as kind of embryology or, or developmental terms. He was trying to understand where abnormal development affected early could lead to adult forms that were different. Mm. And he thought the environment was the trigger for these altered adult forms. Uh, he believed that organic change would happen in large steps. That's uh, something you're gonna see again and again. So this idea that you can go from say one form to a very different form, maybe even a different species in, in one jump is um, versus doing it gradually. This is an idea that that has been debated back and forth. And he did some experiments in the 1820s looking at chicken eggs where he compressed chicken eggs or painted them with different substances or shook them and tried to see if he could affect the early embryo and whether that gave rise to abnormal chickens. And I think the, the bottom line is that um, some people said he was successful, other people said it didn't work and it was inconclusive, but the idea that it was born out of this was something called experimental teratology. Um, this idea that one could manipulate by direct action of the environment, early development. It's like terra, terra meaning the environment. Like yeah, I think, well, teratological, these uh, tumors that, that form, uh, that, that, that have many different developmental outcomes, uh, um, I think that's where it's coming from. Gotcha. Um, okay. The, in terms of the, the, the term. So I, I kind of put the, the French scientists here, the blue box, uh, and, and I want to go to the alternate idea that I think we're all familiar with uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, Wallace and Darwin's theory of, of evolution happening through selection. So here the idea is that the, what the environment is really doing is not generating variation down particular paths. Uh, variation may be completely random what the environment is doing is filtering the variation. So the things that survive, the variants that survive, they're the ones that uh, can produce more offspring and, and outcompete in the next generation. Right. So, so, those, case, so those traits are already there. It's just, they're just being filtered, not necessarily driven by the- Right. So then the question really becomes, uh, you're sort of separating what's causing the variation from, from mm -hmm. the, the filtration of the variation. And, and so, yeah, but what you're saying, AJ, kind of gets to this next, next point. Um, you know, we now think about um, Darwinian evolution as, as, as the um, correct view of how things are working. But it turns out that this idea that the environment is generating variation and maybe not randomly um, is, is persisted and it has quite a, a strong hold on, on us and it certainly had a strong hold uh, in, in the 19th century. So here's Darwin writing in, in his first edition of Origin of Species where he talks about variability. And this gets to your point, AJ, you know, about the filtration and the variability. You know, he's saying th these are really 
two separate things. And, and of course, he didn't understand Darwin and, and Wallace didn't understand the rules of genetics or variation. So, um, but what they, uh, Darwin's pointing out here is that um, the variability might be coming from direct action of the conditions of life, right? So, so I, I highlighted this because this is the kind of language that, that gets back to Chiffois' idea about the direct action of the environment. Yeah. And, and then the next sentence says, it might, something may also be attributed to use and disuse. This is also a nod to the French, in this case, Lamarck, uh, use and disuse. But um, later in the same paragraph, you know, over all these changes, I'm convinced that you know, what's really important is selection. You know, so he's acknowledging we don't really know where variability is coming from. Maybe it's coming from the environment, um, but uh, you know, selection is the main engine of, of evolution. Now it turns out that this was I, I put down the 1950 or sorry the 1859 version um, because uh, the edition because this was the first one. Um, Darwin modified and revised things extensively. And you can see his language change, not only in this passage, but throughout the book, where there's more of an acknowledgement that maybe some of these direct action of the environment and conditions of life may be important even without selection. So there is certainly a kind of a debate about what role kind of environmental induced variation played versus selection. But clearly Darwin thought selection was the main thing, but not everybody did. So to, so to get back to where we kind of kicked everything off and like the early 1900s we're talking about, it almost sounds like um, Dar Darwin was out of favor <laughs> at that point. I think everyone believed that in, in evolution, the question is that people were arguing over the mechanism. Right, and, right. And, and, you know, what, it, it, and so you're absolutely right. You know, that I think everyone uh, bought into evolution, but whether selection was really the thing and what type of variation was important, uh, was it whether it was big jumps or, or, or small gradual differences, which is what Darwin and Wallace uh, emphasized. So this, this kind of kicks us to, as you say, the beginning of the 19th century. There's three things I just want to focus on here in terms of experimental genetics, because this is when um, Mendel's laws were rediscovered independently. One of the people who did so was a guy named Hugo de Vries. He was a Danish botanist. Um, and um, he uh, worked out in his material segregation that, that uh, then they realized you know, was, was published earlier by Mendel. Um, and, and he put together a theory of evolution, which he saw as, as a counter or an alternative to the way that Darwin thought about things. Uh, and he called this mutation theory. Uh, so mutation theory, he published two volumes uh, right around the turn of the 20th century. And in, in which he was arguing that, that species formation happens in jumps, not gradually, uh, and that it's stimulated by the environment and that organisms go through a kind of mutational phases where they kind of generate lots of variation and then they kind of calm down, right? So this is part of his theory. Uh, and, and that selection, you know, is probably not a, a major part of, of evolution. Okay. When, so when did he imagine this mutational phase? Like when there are seeds or? Yeah. Flowers? Well, that's that a good question. Um, you know, I think this, so I put this thing called periodically, he called it periodicity and, and, and um, what he, was observing, and I showed you this plant on the right here. It's a drawing uh, of uh, one of the mutants that he picked up. He called them mutants. Of course, we all think about mutants now, but he meant it in a different way. He, he meant it the way we sometimes would refer to as macro mutants. These are things that were 
wholly different than their progenitors. He called them different species. So in, on the right, this, this drawing is something of uh, evening primrose, Onothera gigas. So this is a, a, new, a new species that came from Onothera uh, lamarckiana. Okay, so that was the, the progenitor. It's very different. It's bigger. It doesn't cross to it. It, it breeds true. It doesn't. Um, and, and so to get to your question then, AJ, I think he, he was seeing in his um, material in a field that he identified a stand of, of these progenitor species. And then he found in the next generation, he could get wholly different looking organisms like this. So, so was he observing like a change in ploidy by like going from diploid to tetraploid or something? Oh, you stole the story. Oh, no, I did. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's super. It's, it's fantastic. You, you are, you are right on. By, by the way, folks, we have not, not rehearsed this, uh, this, this yeah. bit of uh, AJ scientific insight. It's brilliant. So yeah, it turns out that's exactly what these are. These are tetraploids. And, um, and it's right, he, it, it happens in one step, boom, right? Uh, and um, it turns out plants are very tolerant of polyploidy. So these guys had 28 chromosomes instead of 14 chromosomes, right? And that's what leads to this. And he thought this was a new species, but he didn't, he, he didn't understand the, the cytology underneath, okay? That was discovered later, okay? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, for all intents and purposes, it looked like, yeah, this is a new species and it happened right away and there's no selection involved, right? And, and he thought that this was a general mechanism. So we'll get back to this ploidy thing, you know, time permitting if we have, because uh, you're, you're, you're spot on. Okay. Um, so there is a theoretical underpinning for this idea that mutations happen caused by the environment in one step. Okay, and that's what that's where species come from. Okay, there's also a shift around the beginning of the 20th century um, to kind of away from descriptive embryology, if you will, to a more in, in experimental ethos where people were interested in, in manipulating things. Uh, if you were an early geneticist, you wanted to be able to generate new variation. You wanted to make these mutants, right? And so the tools that you had to do it were pretty limited. And so you look to the environment. So a lot of the early experiments that I was reading that, that sounded a lot like the experiments the epigenetics field was doing were exactly yeah. these experiments. They were manipulating the environment, changing salt and humidity, et cetera, and trying yeah. to get alternate forms. And they were looking for mutants, you know, very different forms immediately, okay? And to do that, they needed new institutions. Uh, and uh, there was uh, several proposals out there for what, what sometimes people call biological farms, right? These are a little like agricultural field stations, but they weren't just, uh, you know, focused on, on plants. So the most uh, famous one is something called the Station for Experimental uh, Evolution on Long Island. This is a picture in the early 1900s. This is funded by the Carnegie Institution of Washington uh, under the directorship of Charles Davenport. And uh, he convinced uh, the Carnegie Institution to fund this research. And they were very heavily involved in, in funding early uh, experimental genetics in this field called experimental evolution. So you can see here uh, runs of, of places where they were growing, uh, well, they had animals, a lot of poultry, but they also did a lot of plant work. And this was really is like a farm in the sense that they, there were many different organisms under investigation and there was many different types of manipulation going on. They were trying to breed, you know, fish in the basement of, of the building you see off on the right, trying to see if they would go blind. So again, they were doing these experiments and it, it kind of expecting changes quickly because they were thinking about it in the DeVries kind of framework, 
Um, monsters. That's the monster theory, right? Yeah. And yeah, so I mean, in, in essence, what you're seeing, and I think I articulated on a, a previous slide, is that Geoffroy's ideas about making monsters, essentially, was in a kind of reformulated by De Vries in a genetic context, because he understood genetics, you know, he worked it out, he worked out Mendel's laws himself. And so he started to think about that that idea of environmental stress leading to speciation and, mm -hmm. and causing mutants. Okay, so this is maybe just a, a, an oversimplified view of, of a, I hope illustrates the, what I'm trying to tell you is that early on when genetic laws were rediscovered and people started to do experimental genetics, uh, they were heavily invested in environmental modification uh, and meaning can I make mutants by changing the environment? Um, and as time went on and, you know, kind of maybe started in the late teens, but into the 20s, this emphasis on the environment started to dwindle, okay? And there's a lots of reasons for that. Um, one of which is the thing that AJ's already put his finger on, which is that people started to look at De Vries's mutants and realize, wait a second, <laughs> these, some of them are polyploids, some of them turn out to be, have extra chromosomes, so-called aneuploids. People started to understand the basis. A chromosomal, these were chromosomal mutants that were showing up. And then there, there ensued a debate, which I think we're still having, about what is the importance of chromosomal mutation in evolution versus quote unquote gene mutation, you know? Right. Uh, and that, that idea is, bitter, you know, is there. I just taught genetics uh, last year a bit. I had one lecture on gene mutations, one lecture on chromosomal mutations. I mean, there, there's this tradition of kind of splitting them right, in, right. in two. And um, so De Vries's ideas were losing some of their purchase on the field because some people thought, wait, wait, maybe this is not the right kind of mutation that we should be looking at. But there's also something very important that happens. The tools get better. So the experimental geneticists didn't have many tools. One of the cooler things that you run across in the early literature is they did have one tool to make mutants that was very expensive and hard to get, radium. And so they were doing irradiation early in the 1900s, but not many people could do it and it didn't work that well. But the game changed in the uh, 1920s when commercially available x-ray tubes became, you know, uh, on the market, they, they, they were available. And so X-ray mutagenesis was, you know, first published in, in 1927. Um, and this work was done by Herman Muller in, in, in fruit flies and, and also done in parallel by uh, Louis Stadler in, in barley and corn. And there were other people also doing this uh, in, in, in tobacco. So, uh, there was work in plants, there was work in animals. And it turns out this was hugely successful and hugely influential, that mm. this was a technique that could generate many different types of mutations very quickly at a high frequency. And this then meant, well, we don't need to worry about the environment. We've got a good tool now that's artificial and, and, and we can generate the variation we need. And so I argue that this is kind of the beginning of sort of a split in this environment and genetics. Uh, they could kind of separate from each other because now there's a tool that can be, uh, you know, essentially have the environment out of the equation. Um, and fruit flies become incredibly important here. Um, Muller's work, he kind of is in the tradition of, of Thomas Hunt Morgan. He was in the fly group and went on to have his, his own very influential group. This is really where there's a rise in model systems like Drosophila, 
and a movement away from some of the plant models, which can behave differently, you know, as AJ, you pointed out, you know, yeah. the, the polyploidy, the aneuploidy, these things are not tolerated in uh, very well in animals. So that kind of phenomenology that's associated with some of the genetic um, characteristics of plant systems becomes less important. Okay. okay, that so, makes sense. Th so th then again, cartoon style is this idea that where, where as you kind of move uh, down, down the 20th century, um, experimental genetics, and what I mean by this is really the study of trying to understand what, you know, what genes are, what chromosomes are, how the basics of, of um, genetic information flow. That field starts to focus on a limited number of model systems away from plants. Um, after World War II, very much focused on bacteria and the viruses of bacteria. Um, that kind of the beginning of molecular biology. Mm -hmm. And then people who are working on physiology development, environmental effects, that those fields kind of separated from each other. At least environment was less important. So just, um, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock a little bit. Um, I, yeah, we're there. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do have one more question for you. But if folks want to start um, throwing some questions in the chat, you can do that now. Um, where Where does BTI fit in all this? Because we were formed in 1924, so it seems like right, right smack in the middle of of this bifurcation that you described. Right. Yeah. So if you put on the timeline where BTI, as you say, in, in the mid 20s, um, it's right there where there's this separation. And, and I would argue that, that, that BTI is very much in that yellow box uh, versus experimental um, genetics. And, and so here, here's a quote from William Crocker, who's the first managing director, um, writing in, in 1948 about the formation of the Institute. And he said, you know, we kind of surveyed the situation. We looked around what was going on in the Northeast. Uh, genetics, systemic uh, botany, those were being covered, you know, we we're going to focus on other things, right? And, and they very much did, plant physiology, plant pathology, biochemistry. Uh, they, they stayed away from genetics, and, and part of that was a, a um, you know, a strategy, you know, institutional strategy. Uh, but what, what I find interesting is that Crocker was, was very aware of the importance of X-ray mutagenesis and what this was going to mean to genetics. Uh, so he knew, he knew this was kind of an inflection point, but yet, you know, he, he steered BTI in, in a very productive direction toward focus on hormones and pathology in particular, and then later environmental biology. So I think this is the last slide I, I have here. You know, the, if this is kind of where the beginning, the first few decades were, now, now we kind of look at our research portfolio and we see that things have changed a lot. Uh, in, in some ways, working out the fundamentals of inheritance based on model systems, you know, that was sorted in what I kind of put out as a molecular biology synthesis. Some people kind of pin that to the late 60s. Uh, but, but now we're using genetics and genomics as tools and almost every single research group here at BTI is using that as kind of a foundation, but we're studying the things on the outside of this uh, Ray uh, analogy. Uh, but we're using genetics and genomics as, as tools to address those. So, Things are not separated, they're brought back together. It's really fascinating how they, they did. They separated and now we're back. And they, they've come right. So I think the last little thing I have here is we work on epigenetics in my lab, uh, but it, the Giovanoni lab, the Nelson lab, <clears throat> the Fay lab are also working on, on epigenetics, in particular uh, DNA methylation in, in the Giovanoni and, and Fay's group. And, small RNAs and RNA work is being done in Andrew Nelson's group. So um, 
the idea of in the environment and, and affecting epigenetic information um, is very much alive and, and actively being researched here. Okay. That's fascinating. This is my quick thank you for the people in my lab since I've moved here to um, BTI, who's worked on nuclear organization, and, and uh, also acknowledgement of the history colleagues that I've benefited a lot from uh, their guidance and wisdom over the years. I did want to ask you about that. We don't, don't have any questions yet from, from the Zoom land, but um, how did you could you tell us more about how you got into science history? Because to me, that's really fascinating. And it, it sounds like you can gain insights into what you want to do today by looking back to see how people were thinking about things back then. And I'm, I'm not sure how many science, actually, I honestly don't know how many scientists do that and are really into to science history. But how could you talk a little bit about that and how, how it's impacted your research? Sure. You know, I, I, I think all, all scientists are very interested in, in history. It turns out that oftentimes we look, you know, we, we often, we need to know the old literature, right? You know, uh, but often that old literature is not very, very old, right? Because the technology has driven the field so quickly that if you, you know, go back 10, 20 years, oftentimes that the, those findings are it seem somewhat superficial relative to you know kind of the wealth of in detail that we we know now mm -hmm. um but there are some some fields where you know the old literature is incredibly interesting especially as a um a guide to well different phenomenology uh things that have been studied for years that that are maybe un, in unusual uh systems now um you know and i think that's one of the things that genetics and genomics is, have facilitated is this uh, expansion of our our view of what's appropriate or possible to study in terms of organisms all right I'm not answer, answering your question yet, though. <laughs> I'd say that I think I was very fortunate to have a colleague at WashU, Gar Allen, who was a historian uh, and, and was on the faculty in the Department of Biology. And um, he uh, brought so much uh, to the department. You know, he was not an experimental biologist, but you know, having him um, interacting with everyone I thought was, uh, you know, incredibly enriching. And, and uh, so I spent a lot of time with Gar. Uh, and, and I think that's maybe where I started to get interested in the old literature, you know, with guidance from him and pointing me in the, the direction. I, the last few years I've been working in, in, with Janet Brown at, at Harvard University and as a visiting scholar and occasional um, visitor. And, 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 and Janet works as a, uh, a scholar of Darwin, and that's um, been wonderful to interact with her group. Yeah, I bet. And sometimes it's not always the results of those old papers. Like I, I read a couple, you know, doing. We've got some questions about some of our uh, historical faculty members, Norma Pfeiffer and Helen Purdy Beale. Um, and I was reading some of, the, and sometimes it's like the introductions, like how they, how they frame the the the. Um, like the experiments that they're that they did mm -hmm. going to do sometimes you, like that is really interesting you gain insights from that not not just the results but mm -hmm. kind of you know can see how they were thinking about things and it's it just seems pretty different there too it seems valuable i guess that's that's what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. um we do have a question uh andrew nelson uh asks uh were the scientists at carnegie mellon successful at observing genomic changes in vertebrates, i.e. chickens. Just wondering because plants are so tolerant to genomic changes and birds have relatively stable genomes. Yeah, so that's, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I have to say that, that they did a lot of work on plants. They also worked on insects quite a bit at, at you know, the experimental evolution. Um, and, and, you know, I think one, I guess maybe one way to answer it is it was hard to get 
these changes, right? They didn't work very often. Um, and I think you're right, Andrew, in the sense that there's someone named uh, Blakesley who worked on Datura, which is again, in, in Jimson weed. He was able with one of his colleagues named Belling to show that that cold temperatures during flowering could give you more aneuploids. You know, so I think you're right. Some organisms were more amenable and gave these variants at a higher rate. And again, I, I, I trust, you know, your, your intuition spot on. Animals are less tolerant to epigenetic modification and um, certainly less tolerant to aneuploidy. Um, what role do you see for epigenetics and plant breeding for adapting to climate change? That's a good question. Yes, well, that, yes, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of concern that stress in the environment is, is going to be changing, changing the epigenome in, in say, plants out in the field and that that could, if not affecting their, their inheritance, certainly could affect their performance in, in the field. Um, so I, I do think that there's interest in using epigenetic markers, for instance, in, in marker assistant breeding or genomic selection. But, um, you know, I, I, I think as we understand more about the genomes, but also the epigenomes and, and the folding patterns of genomes, people are going to have the tools to then go back and look under stressful conditions and see out in the field, is the epigenome being changed? Is that changing gene expression? Um, so I think there's there's a lot of pot, uh, potential there. Yeah, and I, I guess I would guess also is that epigenome changes, epigenomic changes being passed on to the next generation of seeds, and then, then could it switch back, I guess, right? Is the genetic information still there? Is the epigenome that's changing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I think that that you know part part of this. But this is my plug for plants, right? You know, plants are plastic. Uh, plants remember epigenetic information, or they don't erase epigenetic information quite as as scrupulously, if you will, uh, as, as animal genomes, and so. Once you make an aberrant, say, DNA methylation change, that can be inherited from one generation to the next in mm -hmm. plants. Um, oftentimes, those type of changes that can be induced in animals are reset. And that has to do with um, the erasure and resetting mechanism early in development of epigenetic information in animals, particularly um, mammals. So uh, plant epigenetics um, is perhaps more plastic and, and perhaps more durable in terms of inheritance. That's what the literature would suggest. So, so in mammals, do, do they get reset like in the embryo or, or mm. after birth? I mean, is that known? I don't know if that's known. Yeah, no, no, there's a lot of work done on this. And I, I think that, that there are you know, the literature suggests there's two waves of resetting that happen pre-implantation in, in, in mammals, um, at least in terms of, 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 say, DNA methylation patterns. Uh, if you look at, say, the male and the female um, gametes and, and the pronuclei in early, early zygotes, you can look at the DNA methylation patterns. And as uh, things progress, those are, are reset and, and built anew. That makes sense because those, I mean, when you look at the development, the gametes in mammals anyway, are they're kind of developed really early on, right? And versus plants, they come from the Mary stems out in, you know, whatever branch mm -hmm. <laughs> they're on, right? So I guess that would kind of make sense if they're if the gametes and mammals are being created when you're still really young before you have those epigenetic changes, mm -hmm. I guess it makes sense that they wouldn't have those changes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's another that's issue, right? From resetting. So, so you know, what, what AJ is talking about is, is um, the 
so one of the arguments, especially against Lamarckian type of evolution, um, was the formulation in, of August Weissman in the late 19th century of the germ soma difference, right? That um, in, in many animals, what the cells that become the germline that go from one generation to the next, those are set aside in early development. So whatever the environment is doing and impacting your somatic cells, your body is not gonna affect your sex cells. You know, those are set aside, they're partitioned early. And you know, as AJ is pointing out, plants don't do that, right? Plants, their development, they're built in a way where uh, they want to develop in an environment uh, that that's almost substitutes for behavior, the meristems are interacting with the environment, and it's only later in development that the reproductive lineages are are partitioned. So there's no you know quote unquote strict germline in in plants. So again, that's another reason why epigenetic differences could potentially be much more important in inheritance in animal, uh, sorry, plants versus animals. That was, that was well said. That was good. <laughs> Way better said than, than I could do it. <laughs> That's that really good. Um, okay, I think we have one last question. Um, not sure if I can phrase this question well, but with the arrival of new tools to edit genomes and the likely release of, of GMO or non-GMO species in the environment, maybe means, uh, genetically engineered species in the environment. Mm -hmm. How well can we model future natural selection at the species level? Mm. Good question. Yeah, so thanks. I'm not one. sure that I'm, I'm may, maybe not capturing um, the full, full in, intent of, of your question, but um, this may be a bit of a detour, but I, I, you're, you're, you're talking about, GMOs or non-GMOs edited plants. One of the concerns that people have raised is that when you go in and make a manipulation, whether it's a transgene or whether it's something that comes in and makes a change and then is kind of flushed out of the system, like you would do in a CRISPR, say generated uh, change, you might be changing the epigenome uh, not just you know the genome, and and so there's some some concerns about whether we should be worried about that or not. Um, so that's one thing I'm thinking about GMOs. That's not quite addressing your question. The other thing that 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 maybe some of you are familiar with, that I'll just make make clear, is that there are some efforts now to go in and do epigenome modification where you can target, say, the enzymes that might change these epigenetic codes, whether it's DNA methylation or certain types of histone modifications, you could target them to specific parts of the genome and modify them. And that maybe that is, you know, it's not really uh, genetic engineering, but it's epigenetic engineering and what value that might have. So it's kind of like, uh... HDAC inhibitors and in, in human cancer. You know, that's a hot, that was a hot, right. <laughs> hot type of. Uh, yeah, no, in, 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 in that case, you know, as you, as you say, whether it's a DNA methylation inhibitor or an HDAC inhibitor to turn on things like tuber suppressor genes, as we talked about, the danger there, of course, is that those are kind of blunt instruments if they're affecting many parts of the genome. But if you could target where in the genome, that activity was, you know, operating. That that may give you a lot more uh, efficiency and, and less toxicity. That's fascinating. I never I never thought of doing that in plants, but that's. Did that answer your question, uh, DJ DJ Joshi? I asked that question. That was a really good question. Um, I think so. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eric for telling us um, all about this fascinating history of genetics, epigenetics, and evolution. That was, that was really, really fun. I enjoyed that a lot. And I hope everyone out there enjoyed it as well.
And um, please join us for BTI's next Breaking Ground discussion series in September. We'll be taking August off for a short summer break and then returning Wednesday, September 29, with BTI faculty member Andrew Nelson, who was mentioned earlier as working on some epigenetic stuff. And we'll be talking about how RNA is a key to help plants respond to environmental stress. Um, so very much related to what we were, we were talking about today. And it's going to be a good one, so please don't miss it. <clears throat> and you can go to btiscience.org for more information and to register. And I'm going to copy and paste some URLs in the chat. So there you go. Um, we got some, some URLs in there. And you can read more about BTI's current research and many other neat stories about BTI science in our annual report, which you can find online at btiscience.org slash annual report. And the 2020 annual report is all digital with three different views. There's a single page view, a two page view, which is most similar to seeing like a hard copy, like a PDF of a hard copy. And there's a reading view, which is like reading an article on the web. Um, so that one is, is especially handy if you're, if you're on a mobile thing. Um, and there are many links to videos and other neat interactive aspects in the online annual report. And uh, thanks again for coming out. Uh, BTI is an independent nonprofit research institute, and we operate in large part thanks to the generosity of community members like you. And if you'd like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give or email our development team at development at btiscience.org. Thank you very much, everybody, for your interest and support of BTI. And thanks again to Eric for, uh, for that fascinating discussion. Really appreciate it. And Thank you, AJ. It was a wonderful day.